Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome again to Syrian Analysis. I'm your host, Kirk Almasian. Today, I'm joined by Dr. Daniela Ganzer. He is an expert in international politics, and I've been a big fan of Dr. Daniela Ganzer for quite some time. I've been introduced to his work since 2015 when I moved in Germany, and a very good Syrian friend of mine, she sent me a, a short video on Instagram and she said, Kevok, you have to follow Dr. Daniela Ganza. He is speaking the truth about Syria and you're trying to educate the people about the Syrian case since you moved in uh, to Germany. So I started following his work. This was my birthday book, guys, The Illegal Wars of uh, NATO in 2022. It's his book. And one of his uh, newer books, USA Ruthless Empire, this is in English. I will put all the links in the description below for his work and also to purchase his books. Dr. Daniela Ganza, thank you very much for being my guest. It's a really honor to have you on my channel. Hi, Kevok. Thanks a lot for inviting me. And I'm very glad that you like my book. Actually, uh, I think one of the uh, brilliant uh, things that you are doing on social media platforms is educating the people, enlightening them. And nowadays, when we turn on our TV channels, we see that it's black and white, it's cartoonish analysis and without a context. Therefore, I would like to start with you with the current conflict that everybody is speaking about is what is happening in Palestine uh, and the events unfolding there. I think everybody is watching and trying to understand what's happening there. In your opinion, in what context do you put the October 7 attacks. Is it a pure, some people say it's a pure evil terrorist attack by bar barbarian Hamas uh, terrorists on Jewish people. So the motivation here is anti-Semitism. And other people say this is a militant attempt to break the siege on Gaza, which included a mixture of resistance and probably also terror tactics. But the motivation here is not anti-Semitism, but to break the siege on the Strip. Um, well, obviously, the Gaza war is a, is a brutal war. I mean, it uh, it didn't start on October 7, uh, 2023, so that's now two months ago. But it has a long, long history, and and, and basically, it it goes back into that into that conflict when when Israel was founded, and we had the, the first Nabka, and we had the then the 67 war with a lot of wars, one war after another, and we never really had peaceful coexistence between Israelis and Palestinians. And my main point, really, when I talk about Israel-Palestine is that we should not focus on either Netanyahu is right or Hamas is right, because that's what people on TV try to do. The, the, the people who think Hamas has a, has a, has a good point to, to fight the occupation or Netanyahu has a good point to fight the evil terrorists. They they sort of gather in their groups and they become radicalized and they kill each other. And I think what is important to realize is that there are many, many different positions within Israel apart from Netanyahu's position. He has one position, but there are many, many dissenting voices who say, um, we need a ceasefire, for instance. I mean, I'm I'm a Swiss historian. I'm 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 not I'm not a Jew. I'm not an Israeli. I'm not a Muslim. I'm not a Palestinian. But I think calling for a ceasefire is is really the right thing. We cannot solve the problem um, with military means, and and the and Hamas cannot solve the problem with military means either. But next to Hamas, there are many, many different other voices in, in the Palestinian group or in the Muslim world as a whole. And um, the best thing I think that we can do is to focus on these voices for peace. And they exist among the Muslims and among the Jews. Um, and I think it's very sad that we always hear from the radicals who have nothing to offer. The radicals always say, we have to kill the other group and then we'll have peace. And that's a lie. It's just a lie. It will not work. I mean, if, even if Netanyahu bombs um, the Gaza Strip for many, many weeks, and he has been doing that now for, for a long time, you cannot eradicate a terrorist organization uh, because it's, um, it's actually a thought, you know. In the end, it's a thought that you say, this is injustice, and I'm going to fight against injustice with terrorism. Now, just imagine a young boy who's maybe 10 years old now, and both his parents uh, were killed in the last uh, two weeks. He has nothing to lose. So he's being radicalized. He's going to be a terrorist when he's 20. So that's what I'm saying. Um, the only way to, to solve the Gaza conflict, to solve the conflict between Israel 
and between Palestine is to focus on the voices of peace. And they all say we need a ceasefire. And they're Jewish and they're Muslim and they're Christians and Hindus and Buddhists. They all say we need a ceasefire. Yeah, the ceasefire is, of course, uh, in my opinion, is a good start in order to stop the bloodshed in Palestine between the Israelis and the Palestinians. However, what comes after the ceasefire is something that we have also to discuss. Are we going to establish a two-state solution? Are we going to have a one state on where everyone lives under uh, one constitution and one laws and one regulations, similar, uh, let's say, uh, responsibilities, right, in front of the law? Netanyahu said uh, just recently that he is proud to have killed the Oslo Accords, which were one of the attempts to establish a two-state solution between the Palestinians and the Israelis. His ambassador to the UK said she doesn't believe Palestinians have the right to have a state. Uh, Israeli officials uh, called uh, the Palestinians many things uh, like subhumans, human animals, called for flattering Gaza, called them Amalek, suggested nuking them. I mean, when I read these statements, I ask myself, is this radicalism exclusive to the BB government? Or does Israel suffer from institutionalized problem with radicalism? And some people here say this is coming from the ideology of Zionism, similar to the uh, people in the Arabic world that they had a problem with radicalism because of Wahhabism, and sometimes also attributed to the Muslim Brotherhood ideology? I think that the Netanyahu government is a very right-wing government and uh, it clearly is a very radical government and under Netanyahu I don't see a two-state solution. Um, you've asked what is the solution and I think in the end the two-state solution still is a good idea but we're very far from it. I mean if you look at the map the Gaza Strip now is half of it in the north is completely destroyed the infrastructure is destroyed so um that's one problem the second problem is that be the west bank is split into many many different little bits because you know part of these are uh, controlled by israel part of these are controlled pa by palestinians you know the situation and so if you have a two-state solution, you at least need free movement between Gaza and the West Bank. And we're very far away from that. Mm -hmm. Everybody can see it. We're very far from away from it. Then you have the problem with the settlers in the West Bank. And when I, when I tell people, well, this cannot go on. You cannot um, have settlers in occupied territory. It's illegal. You shouldn't do it. Um, then people say, there's no way we can stop the settlers. So that will... You know, I still think it's possible to solve conflicts without violence. It might seem strange now in December 2023 when I say this, but I'm totally convinced that at the end of the day, what Netanyahu is doing or what Hamas is doing is not bringing us forward. It's more, it's like moving us closer to the abyss. And I really like the dissenting voices among, among, the Israeli community, there are a lot of dissenting voices. This really has to be said. Yes. Uh, there, were, there were very, very strong criticism um, against Netanyahu before the war started. People uh, were on the streets, not because of you know the, the conflict in, in Gaza, but because he, Netanyahu tried to make a reform. You're, you're aware of it. But they called him crime minister, not prime minister, crime minister. So there was a lot of opposition to um, the policies of Netanyahu and also in the military and in the secret services many people ask how was it possible then that on on 7 October 23 the reaction um, of the uh, Israeli military was so slow you know there's a huge debate going on I mean were there warnings to the Netanyahu government before the attack came um, General uh, Kamil from from Egypt the director of the secret service in, in Egypt um, says he warned uh, Netanyahu that Hamas was going to carry out an attack. Netanyahu says, well, uh, what General Kamil says is not true. I never got a warning. Um, we also have Israeli journalists who say this is this is very strange, you know, that Hamas could break out and could go to the kibbutzim and take hostages and go back why was why were they not engaged before so what i what i tried to do uh, kevork is really 
I try to split the different voices up into different groups. Netanyahu is just one voice. I don't think he's a voice for peace. I think within the Israeli and also the Jewish community, there are voices for peace. We should listen to them. And they always say, okay, let's work towards the two-state solution. You've also you've also mentioned the, the one-state solution with everybody having equal rights. That would also be an option. But I think that's yeah. even further away. <laughs> yes. Know, I, I know that's like theoretically a good idea. But if you now see the rights that people, the Palestinians have in the West Bank and the rights that the Jewish settler have in the West Bank, it's not the same. And if you say... We bring them on the same level and, you know, we just close all the checkpoints. We close all um, the differences that there are. And we make this a one state with equal rights uh, for, for, for Jews and Muslims. Theoretically, a very good idea. I'm fully with you. Yeah. But practically, I don't see it. So I still say the two-state solution for me and I know many critics, I've had many friends criticizing me, uh, yeah. but I still think this two, this, uh, the two-state solution would, a, a, would be a sensible step. And the way to the two-state solution for me is first a ceasefire. We need a ceasefire because children are being killed every day. I mean, yes. this, is not, this is not good for, for anybody. You, know, you can't say, let's kill a few more children. This is going to make things better. No. So let's have a ceasefire first. And then we, we must come back to this two-state solution. But I don't think Netanyahu is able to do that. I think, I think if I may add, I think, um, and that is in, on the public record, Netanyahu said we must support Hamas. Um, he said that many years ago because Hamas is not you know, willing uh, mm -hmm. to go into a two-state solution. And otherwise... Yes have to deal with Fatah, they want the two-state solution. But if we support Hamas and they still exist and they have their radicalism, that helps us of because course. then we can say we have, we have no serious partner here. Uh, mm -hmm. We have Hamas, we have the Fatah, so the Palestinians among them are crazy. They don't, they don't even have a coherent voice. So now that historians, and, and it's being discussed on the internet a lot, why has Netanyahu supported Hamas? And the answer is not because he wanted the terrorist act to happen, but because he wanted to split up the Palestinians and because he wanted um, to make the two-state solution impossible. Yes, and now it blew up to, on his face and he is uh, yeah. getting lots of backlash in his own society. And as you mentioned, there are many pro-peace voices. And when we speak about the two-state solution or the one-state solution, I think if we want to go to one-state solution, there has to be a phase before the one-state solution that is uh, uh, establishing a two-state solution that is de-radicalizing as the same way that they radicalize the settlers or some of the Palestinians in this regard. They should be internationally embraced de-radicalization through the curriculums, through the re-indoctrination of the people for a generation or two in order to pave the way for one state solution. This is a very long run strategy in my opinion. But today I was reading for example that uh, Netanyahu is threatening Lebanon this time with a ground uh, invasion. Uh, do you think this could go out of hand and we could see a, a regional war with international ramifications such as the participation of the U.S. warships, uh, Iranians, uh, Houthis, Hezbollah, Syria. This could go out of hand, right, at any moment. I, I think, you know, uh, Kevor, every, every conflict, every conflict that we have as human beings can go out of hand. You know, that's just the nature of a conflict. I mean, if, if as human beings we have a fight with a friend, you know, or if, if in a marriage situation, husband and wife, you know, they have a fight. We all know from our personal experience um, that it can go completely in a crazy direction. And when both look back, say, gee, I didn't know that this, you know, could it go that way? Had I known, you know, I, <laughs> I maybe would have said nothing. So from our experience as human beings, I'm not even talking about war and killing just about the complexity of, of conflicts. Um, we all know conflicts can, can, can just explode. They can. And that's why the ceasefire is so important. If we have a ceasefire now, um, many of us tend to think, well, that's just to protect the children in Gaza. And, you know, that's reason enough. 
that's reason enough. We can have the ceasefire right now just for the children in, in Gaza. And then it feels like an altruistic thing. Like, I care mm -hmm. for the children in Gaza. It's just one week now until we have Christmas, okay? And you shall not kill. You shall not kill is the basic message of 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 the christian religion and it's also in the jewish religion it's it's in the muslim religion it's in the buddhist religion if you go into the religions deeply you know you'll find many quotes for many things but that we should not kill as human beings is a very very profound wisdom it's normal that we have conflicts but we should not kill so netanyahu yes. shouldn't kill the hamas shouldn't kill now i know yes. we're far away from it we seem to have forgotten it all but if we if we come back, if we come back to this wisdom and we say, okay, let's stop the killing, let's have the ceasefire, then it's not only to save the children in Gaza, it's also to stop an escalation. You mentioned that Netanyahu might want to fight the war in the north, in Lebanon. Now, if he fights a war in the north, in, in Lebanon, against Hezbollah, then obviously Israel is in a, in, in, in a two-sided war. Okay, in the north and in the south, that for every army is much more difficult to handle. So, you know, it, it would make matters much more complicated for Israel. Yes. And then the situation, you know, you ask me, can, can it explode? I'm saying, yes, of course it can explode. And I don't want to paint a dark picture here, but I want to say it's also in our very best self interest to have a ceasefire and to have everybody calm down. And everybody take a step back and put the, the weapons away. Because the next thing that can happen that you have in the West Bank, a situation which goes out of control. It's possible. It can go out of control. And yes. then you mentioned the Houthis who can fire a weapon against the a US ship. And, and the Americans, you know, the Americans are there with their ships off the coast. The Americans are not with soldiers in Israel, or the Americans are not with soldiers in the Gaza Strip, okay? It's the Israeli army which is basically invading now the Gaza Strip, trying to get rid of as many Palestinians as possible. And Netanyahu says, I'm just fighting terrorists, but the world can see that he's killing terrorists and that he's killing babies, and that if he's killing babies, he's creating new terrorists in 20 years. So the Americans are off the coast and they're watching all this and they have their their weapons ready and the Iranians are on the other side they have their weapons ready Syria is watching Egypt is watching they're all watching and so yes it is very dangerous it is one of these conflicts that is 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 so sad for peace researchers uh, that we we still, after 75 years, have not been able to solve it. I'm now 50, 51 years old, and whenever I've been writing books and having lectures or or going to school, and even when I was a kid, there was this war going on, the war yeah. between Israel and Palestine. Sometimes, you know, it was calm, and, you know, that calm means just a few dead, and sometimes it was really evil with thousands of dead. But it was yes. never like a year where you could say there were moments when we were hoping, oh, now, now it's calming down. The moderates of both sides have reached their hands. But then the extremists from both sides came in. Yes. So, yes, it can go out of hand. And because it can go out of hand, I think we need a ceasefire. And I think really UN Secretary uh, General um, has, 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 has correctly said that we we need to see the larger context of this. It's dangerous. Yes. We don't want, I mean, Kevok, you are the same as me. We don't want Iran and US throwing weapons at each other while Israel is invading Lebanon and bombing the kids in Gaza. I mean, who wants a 2024 like that? Nobody yes. really wants that, except the uh, arms industry. <laughs> I think, yes, this is this is one of the issues. And um, in order to strike a ceasefire, we will need a global power. And the global power here is still the United States. And the United States, because it is, um, it, it has a different approach, right? And here I'm going to link it with Ukraine, for example. In the Ukraine case, the Americans send lots of weaponry, ammunition, support to Ukraine in order to repel the uh, Russian invasion. This is according to the United States. And when it came to the Israeli side and with the carpet bombing of uh, Gaza, the United States had a different approach. So the people are asking this question, has the United States lost its status as a global power, as a world police, as a power that can 
uh, broker peace between different parties can enforce ceasefire. Because recently, uh, Jack Sullivan, he was in uh, in Tel Aviv and he met with the, the intelligence community uh, of uh, of Israel, and it seems that he received the pushback from the Netanyahu government. So the people are asking here the question: Has the United States lost its position as a global power that can enforce ceasefire now in the region in order for the situation not to go out of hand? Um, no, I think the U.S. Um, is still in such a position because if you look at the U.N. Security Council, we had Brazil. Lula da Silva is the president of Brazil. Now, Lula da Silva, through his ambassador, had a vote uh, introduced in the U.N. Security Council asking for a ceasefire. Now, in the U.N. Security Council, we have five veto powers. So it's U.S., it's Russia, it's China, it's France, and it's Great Britain. And we have 10 other nations which are rotating members. So we have 15 members in the security. Council. I know that you know it, but I'm just explaining it for the audience. Mm -hmm. And these 15 have then taken a vote. And it was the United States which blocked with a veto the ceasefire. And that was not just once. It happened again at the, mm -hmm. at the later time. It was not Brazil which came up with a, a resolution. It was another country which introduced a resolution. And again, it was U.S. President Joe Biden who blocked it with a veto. So I think, yes, the U.S. is actually the power that can tell Netanyahu, now we're going to have a ceasefire, and it's going to come through the U.N. Security Council, you know, um, because Israel is not a veto power in the U.N. Security Council. So Israel really needs diplomatic protection by the United States and the veto power that the United States has. It's still possible, you know, that the U.N. Security Council says, unanimous decision, 15 uh, or, or, you know, like 13 in favor, two abstentions, but no veto. If the U.N. Security Council says Israel must stop the bombing of Gaza, then this is international law. And when Netanyahu then says, I don't care. I don't care what you say. I don't, I don't care what you decide in New York. We are on our mission now to, to push the Palestinians, it's 2 million people, out of Gaza into Egypt. If that's our mission, we try to do it, okay? He can still do that, but it's becoming much, much more difficult because then he's breaking international law on the level of the UN Security Council every day. Yes. Um, so, yes, I think the United States still has a lot of influence on that conflict, and I'm very, very sorry to say they don't take a position for peace, okay? Joe Biden is not, is not supporting the ceasefire. He, he's just... He's supporting Netanyahu and the bombing of the Gaza Strip. So yes. what is happening is that the moral respect, I mean, it de always depends how high is the moral respect for the White House anyway. But if we say there's some respect for the White House, it's not about the U.S. population. You know, they, they like the Israeli population. They have many different perspectives on that conflict. But the moral perspective on Washington is such that people say, why is U.S. President Joe Biden blocking the ceasefire why children are being killed uh, in, yes. in Gaza? Why is he doing this? So, yes, I, I still think the U.S. has influence, but I don't see that they use it in a positive way. They just don't use it. And if you if you compare it with, with Ukraine, it becomes totally contradictory. Because in yes. Ukraine, if you allow, we have the Russians making an invasion. That was in, on February um, in 2022, so last year. And then the Americans said, well, that's totally unacceptable. You cannot invade in another country. And many people came like, well, the U.S. invaded Iraq in 2003, so why should that be totally unacceptable? And you bombed Vietnam in the 60s, and you invaded in Panama in 89, and you bombed uh, Syria in 2014. So, but let's leave that aside. U.S. said it's unacceptable. Then the Russians conquered part of the for part of the ukraine the eastern part so the, the the russians are now an occupying force in ukraine and the americans said we're not going to go uh, with that you cannot have a country which is occupying um another country now with israel and palestine you have israel which is occupying palestine 
Um, I know Palestine is not a working state. You know, it's 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 an idea where the Palestinians hope they will get to, but Israel is clearly the occupying power in the Gaza Strip and also in the West Bank. So now you have a contradiction. Once in Ukraine, the US say we cannot accept any power which is occupying land of somebody else, and in Israel they they argue exactly the opposite they say yes that's a very good occupying power <laughs> and it's now bombing uh, children in the gaza strip so that's why we are against the ceasefire i mean it's such an obvious contradiction i mean at least people in the muslim world see it yeah and more and more people in europe see it and i, th I think a lot of um observers in the us see it as well yeah yes and the time time difference between the Ukraine war and the Palestine current conflict is very, very short. The people yep. didn't forget yet what the Americans said about the Ukraine war. It was only a few weeks before this uh, uh, attack on the Gaza Strip. But almost two years uh, passed to the Ukraine war. And when I see the map of control, I put the map in front of me. Something tells me that Ukraine is not winning uh, this war and the US uh, lost the proxy war against uh, uh, Russia. Does this, however, necessarily necessarily mean that we are heading to a multipolar world as Russia is claiming because every time when they advance a few meters they come and say we are redrawing the the international system and we are restructuring the international system and we are heading to a multipolar world yes I think we're actually now in a multipolar world it's not mm -hmm. something which is coming it's something which is here I mean if you look at the year 2024 um, it's now one month away or two weeks away, and then 2024 will start. Now, in January 2024, the BRICS are Brazil, B, R for Russia, I for India, C for China, and S uh, for South Africa. These are five countries, but they will have new members which are going to join the BRICS in January. And uh, these are Egypt. Now, Egypt, as we know, is in a strategic, very important location. It's bordering Gaza. OK, there's one exit. If you want to get out of Gaza, um, you can go into into Egypt. There's one checkpoint which is closed right now. Sometimes they open it just for for um, for emergency, for emergency. You know, some 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 foreign diplomats can get out there, but it's not everybody can go through that checkpoint into Egypt because Egypt says we don't want the two million Palestinians coming into into Egypt. We don't want that uh, because uh, Netanyahu is never going to let them back. That's what they say. Um, so Egypt, as I wanted to say, is joining the BRICS in January. It's not only Egypt; it's also Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia is joining the BRICS in January. So we, we're talking in two weeks. Iran, Iran is a huge, huge actor uh, on the scene with links to Hezbollah in Lebanon. Iran is joining the BRICS uh, and Argentina is joining the BRICS. Sudan is joining the BRICS. So the BRICS uh, and the Emirates are joining the BRICS. So the BRICS are going to get bigger. And what does that mean? The BRICS countries are 3.5 billion. We are 8 billion, the whole planet, 8 billion people in 193 countries. The NATO countries, that's 31 countries. Uh, Finland has now joined NATO, but it's 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 31 countries. And the NATO countries are 1 billion. So there's 1 billion people here, and there's 3.5 billion there. Mm -hmm. and, and what we don't understand in NATO countries, I mean, Germany and Switzerland and Austria, where, where I am, uh, is that NATO is losing power. And what does that, what, why do I say that? NATO lost in Afghanistan, okay? 20 years war from 2001 to 2021. Very, very long war. Um, the idea was to overthrow uh, the Taliban, uh, which they did. And in the end, the Taliban came back to power. So it, the, the war is lost, was lost in Afghanistan. And people were going, how is that possible? These, these Talibans were just some dudes on motorbikes, and how could they win the war? But they won. Yes. Now, first point. Second point, NATO said, we're going to send tanks to Zelensky, the president of Ukraine. And Zelensky, with the help of NATO, is going to push the Russians out of the Krim, Crimea, and he's going to push the Russians out of all of Ukraine. So 
we as NATO will inflict a serious defeat on Russia. I have to tell you, it doesn't look like that. It looks mm -hmm. the opposite. It looks like Zelensky is going to lose. It looks like Putin is going to win. Obviously, this is not a conflict which is over. But if we look at the year which is now drawing to an end, Ukraine has tried to push back uh, the Russians force, Russian forces. But the Russian forces in Ukraine have really, you know, dig in. Their, their positions are really solid. And the Ukraine military has not been able to break through. And Ukraine military has been losing a lot of young men. More and more young men were injured, were crippled, and were killed. Yes. And as it looks, nobody knows what will happen next year, but as it looks, um, Russia is in a much stronger position, position. And that means also in Ukraine, NATO is not looking very strong. And let's take a third country, which you know very well, Syria. U.S. President Barack Obama bombed Syria in uh, 2014 and tried to get rid of President Assad. I have it all in my book. And then, you know, just to summarize things in a may maybe too simplistic way, but really Assad called Putin and said, uh, Americans are trying to overthrow me. Can you help me? And then Putin came into Syria and bombed Muslim extremists, which have been armed by the CIA in Syria to overthrow mm. Assad, and who won? The Russians won in Syria, together with Assad, because Assad is still in power, and the CIA basically lost the war in Syria. Obama lost the war in Syria, and that's still not a reflection that we have that we have really understood in in Western Europe. We're not talking about it because we say, "Oh, Afghanistan, did we lose that war?" I don't, I don't really remember, and. Ah, Syria, did we lose that war as well? Well, did we? I'm not sure. Were we involved at all? You know, it's it's all in, 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 in the mist and nobody wants to talk about it. But if you really break it down to the conflicts that we've seen in the last 10 years, then I think we're very quickly moving towards an international order where NATO is getting weaker and the BRICS are getting stronger. And that means that we absolutely need these groups to talk. We need them to talk. And that's why we don't only need a ceasefire in Gaza, we also need a ceasefire in Ukraine. And one last thing, after the Russian invaded in February 2022, that's an illegal invasion. You know, you cannot invade another country, it's illegal. But the Americans in 2014 had carried out a coup d'etat in Ukraine. That was also illegal. Nobody wants to talk about it. <laughs> and now that important point is coming more and more clear that in March 2022, there were peace talks in Turkey, in Istanbul. OK, yes. and Zelensky and Putin were very close to reaching a deal. The deal was Ukraine stays neutral and the Russians go back home. Yes. They keep the Crimea, but the rest, you know, will be fine. It would have been the best deal ever. Yes. And, then, and that is very important. Joe Biden, U.S. President Joe Biden and British Prime Minister Johnson said, Zelensky, you're not going to sign this peace deal. Why? Because U.S. and U.K. thought we're going to really, really kick the Russians back. Yes. No. And now it turns out that would have been the best peace deal. And people in Switzerland and in Germany and Austria don't don't even know, don't even no. know that there was such an excellent peace deal on the table in Istanbul in uh, March 2022. So, yes, we're moving towards a multipolar world very clearly. Uh, unfortunately, these uh, peace talks that uh, were held in Istanbul, when we spoke about it back then, uh, they uh, said this is a Putin talking point, Kremlin talking point, etc., etc. And I really genuinely care about the Ukrainian people, and I didn't want for the Ukrainians to suffer half a million uh, casualty rate like we did in Syria. And we know at the end of the day how is this conflict is going to end. It was impossible for the Ukrainian army with the equipment, military, and the manpower that they had to beat the, the Russians. However, the Americans and the Brits, they had a different opinion. But one of the uh, parties involved in this conflict is Germany. And 
it, it is headed, I would say, I would argue by the Greens. And this is very ironic here that they were they all the time saying that we'll support Ukraine as long as it takes. And they are very enthusiastic in beating the Russian side here. And I'm seeing history in front of me and you see the Greens are running on a peace platform, not sending weapons to uh, Krieg zone, they say, to the to the Kriegsgebiet, uh, to the war zones, etc. And then they participated in bombing Yugoslavia and now they are participating in the Ukraine proxy war. How 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 is this contradiction happening from a political party that is a green party, let's say? It, it's something totally crazy. I mean, for people, you, you told me quite a few of your listeners are in the United States. I have to explain yeah. them the situation in Germany. Um, in Germany, the Green Party started in the 1980s. They were mm -hmm. small and they said, we're critical of war and we're against nuclear power and we're against NATO. That was basically the story. Yeah. So people voted for the Green Party who were hippies, you know, people who were really looking for alternative lifestyle, more peace, more love, uh, I don't know, yoga, meditation and sunflowers. Basically, that was that was the group who voted for the Green Party. And then came the year 1999. It's already 24 years ago, but it's very important to remember the year 99. The Green Party was in power and they had a foreign minister. His name was Joschka Fischl. Fischl. And people in the US probably have never heard of him. But he was very strongly in favor of bombing Serbia. Together mm -hmm. with US President Bill Clinton. I also have it in the book. Mm -hmm. And that was clearly illegal. You know, it's clearly illegal. The United States, under Bill Clinton, bombed Serbia. And the Green Party in Germany and the Social Democrat Party of Gerhard Schröder, who was then the chancellor, they, together with the US, bombed Serbia. That was totally illegal. It, you know, people go like, the Russians invaded in Ukraine. We've never had a war in Europe since 1945. I always go, no, that's wrong. Uh, Serbia is part of Europe and it was bombed by Germany and the US in 99. And 99 is after 45. So, you yes. know, people try to forget about it and they say, no, it never happened, but it happened. And so it was already, um, there was a lot of reason to be become suspicious of the Green Party in 99. But then uh, in 22, it became even worse. Um, the Green Party, together with the Social Democrat Party, um, were then dominant forces in the German uh, government. So you have Olaf Scholz, who's the chancellor, and the foreign minister is Annalena Baerbock. And Annalena Baerbock is from the Green Party in Germany. And she always says, we have to send weapons to Zelensky to defeat Russia. Okay, we really have to help the Ukrainians because the Euro Ukrainians are good and the Russians are bad. So exactly as you said, you know, the stories that are being told are so simple, you know, very, very simple stories of these are the good guys. We have to arm the good guys and then the good guys will win. It was all nonsense. It was total nonsense from the beginning, because, as you said, the Germans then sided with Zelensky, president of Ukraine. The Germans sided with the weaker party and by sending weapons to Ukraine, they prolonged the war. They really prolonged the war. Had they had any interest, and they really had interest in, in saving lives in Ukraine, they should have supported the peace talks in Istanbul in March 22, because Olaf Scholz was involved. You know, he, he heard about it and, you know, he, he was not against it. But when Joe Biden and Boris Johnson said, we're not going to have any peace talks with the bad Russians, um, then Olaf Scholz should have said, as a European, he should have stood up against the U.S., and against the British and say, these peace talks are very important. Let's have peace talks. Um, so on the whole, the Green Party is now really a war party. It's it's very, very sad for, for Green voters who, who, who thought they vote for, for a peace party, who vote for an um, alternative lifestyle party, whatever. And um, I personally know quite a few Green voters who are, who are devastating. They... they, they they feel betrayed, you know, like yes, totally because the, the Green Party said and Annalena Baerbock, who, who is the Green German foreign minister, she's not probably well known in the US, but she said before she was elected, she said the Green Party is never, ever going to send weapons into a war zone. 
and then they were elected and then they did exactly that mm -hmm. so yeah they really fooled the population in germany and you know quite a few germans are really really angry at that because if i if i may add one part of the german population understands that would be much better to have good economic relationships with russia because then russia could send cheap russian gas to germany and germany <laughs> as an economic power could flourish with cheap energy resources but as seymour hirsch has said um joe biden blew up the north stream pipeline so you know it's difficult to have uh, german uh supplies from russia the gas supplies and the green party doesn't want to import any gas from russia so among economic advisors in germany they also are scratching their head because they go okay yeah we can import gas on tankers liquefied natural gas from the us or from qatar but it's much more expensive and the yes. Ger german economy is just going to go down and the green party says we don't care we don't want any gas from russia so it's yeah. really I, I don't think if, if i may sum it up like that that the green party is, is doing anything good for germany i don't see it yeah, uh, it, the last elections was in 2021, right? Uh, I think uh, back then I I posted the story on on Instagram. I I told my German friends if you want to vote for war, vote for the Greens, and everybody was like, "What are you talking about? Those are yeah. the environmentalists. Those are the peace uh, seekers, etc., cetera, etc." Cetera. But I know from firsthand experience in Syria up until this moment, they support the jihadists in 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 Syria and they call them freedom fighters. The spokesperson of the Green Party in 2019 or 20, he called. Idlib, which is, according to the Pentagon, the largest safe haven for Al-Qaeda terrorists after 9-11, they call Idlib the bastion of democracy in Syria. And I attended one of their uh, events uh, on Syria in the Bundestag to understand their point of view. And I didn't know that I'm known in the, in, the, in the Green Party, and they were very upset by my presence and uh, lots of the uh, members of the Green Party started insulting me in the conference itself, and they had four speakers. Everyone is speaking the same line about Syria, and I don't understand how is it uh, possible in a country like Germany where we should respect each other's opinions that, and also speak different opinions. Everybody is speaking the same line, and only my presence there was very, very provocative, and me and my friend were kicked out at the end of the event from the uh, conference anyways. But since I come from Syria, I have witnessed the uh, what I call the U.S.-led regime change war in Syria. Yeah. It is called a revolution in the media. It is called an uprising against a dictatorship. In any ways, whatever the, the naming, the faming they are trying to do, the simple question here would be that every Syrian asks, why the United States decided to uh, wage a regime change war against Syria? Why did they want to destroy Syria? Why this war happened uh, at the first place when Syria was not posing a national security threat, for example, against the United States? You know, that's a very fundamental question. Uh, it's a question that Vietnamese have have asked themselves. Why were we bombed by the US? It's a question that Iranians have asked themselves. Why was Mossadegh, our prime minister, elected pri democratically elected prime minister, overthrown in 1953 by the British and by the American Secret Service, by the MI6 and the CIA? That's the question that people in Guatemala ask themselves. Mm -hmm. Why were we attacked? Arbenz, who was the president of Guatemala, he was overthrown by the CIA. That's what people in Nicaragua ask themselves. They say, why has the CIA armed the Contras? Why the Contras, are, they're, they're killing us. Why, why are they fighting against the Sandinistas? What's going on? What, 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 it's not the business of the CIA to intervene here in Nicaragua. That's the question that the people in Libya ask when the US started to bomb Libya in 2011, overthrew Gaddafi and Gaddafi was later killed. I mean, come on, what rights did Barack Obama have to bomb Libya? He had no right, no right. It was totally illegal. And that's the question people in Ukraine ask. Why did the US government overthrow the democratically elected leader in Ukraine in 2014? You know, it was it, it was a coup d'etat. It was not, you know, some, some peaceful um, people gathering on the Maidan. No, no, no. On 20 February 2014, we had snipers who killed both policemen and who killed uh, demonstrators. So they killed both groups and created a lot of chaos. And that, that led to the overthrow of the government of Yanukovych. And 
it's it's many many countries now you're from syria you ask yourself why why did they attack us and obviously i have a whole list here um uh, of of countries which were bombed uh, which where where we have regime chains etc first of all i want to say i'm very very sorry you know i'm really sorry it's big big injustice that is happening here uh, secondly i see that the united states tried to project power okay that's the idea projection of power means i control the world and whoever disagrees with me is being killed overthrown whatever okay that's we, we're not going to tolerate any opposition and that is an idea which comes out of this 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 insane plan to control the world i mean it, this this question, you know, it comes up in me and I say, why does anybody want to control the world? We're 8 billion people in 193, 193 countries. How can one country control the world? Is it possible? And the answer is, no, it's not possible. It's not possible. And, okay, it happens again and again and again, but people now start to realize it. And one point I really want to make, Kevork, is we have 330 million people in the U.S., most people in the US, they don't know nothing about all these wars, nothing. And they are very decent, hardworking people. And they just have, and that's what I criticize, is that what I have to criticize, they have some blind trust in their government. So if, if US President Bush says, we have to fight in Afghanistan, they say, Jesus Christ, that's a, that's a long distance. Where is Afghanistan anyway? Okay, they check it on the map. But they support the president because they think the president, he's probably a wise man. I tell you, he's not. Okay, he's not. He's working with the military industrial complex. You sh the money that you spend on your military, you should, use, you should use that in the US on your infrastructure. You should use it for your schools, for your hospitals. You should use that money for, for your really direct needs and not to bomb Syria or attack Iraq or bomb Libya or bomb Serbia or bomb Vietnam or bomb Laos or bomb Cambodia or overthrow the government in Guatemala or overthrow the government in Chile. It's not good. So imperialism, as I describe it here in my book, is not only something which hurts the people in, in Syria or in Afghanistan, it also in the end hurts the people in the US. But I have to add, it's a very, very complicated discourse. It's very hard, you know, if if you start to realize that you've been lied to by the media, yes. by CNN, by the New York Times, by the Washington Post, by Fox News, by MSNBC, everything. Like, it, I'm not saying everything they say is wrong. I'm not saying that. But the way they portray the wars of the Pentagon is always, there is a bad guy. His name is, and then mm -hmm. fill in the blank, okay? Mm -hmm. His name is Gaddafi. We got to get, we got to kill him. His mm -hmm. name is Osama, Osama bin Laden. We got to get rid of him. His name is Assad. We got to get rid of him. It's always, they always, not a the boogeyman. <laughs> it's, it's the boogeyman. And that's not how, po that's not how politics works. And so I'm, I'm very grateful for the work you do because you offer people context, you know, context. We need context. We need, for instance, in the Syrian case, we need to explain, and I, I'm very happy that you explained that uh, on your YouTube channel, that the CIA was arming radical Muslims in Syria in that Operation Timber Sycamore. I have it in my book. Yes. But most people have never heard of Operation Timber Sycamore. And the Syrians Jeffrey, haven't heard about Timber Sycamore. <laughs> there you go. There you go. But Jeffrey Sachs, who's a professor in the USA, a very clever, very honest man, um, he spoke openly about uh, Operation Timber Sycamore. And he said, okay, yes, the CIA invested many millions in Syria to arm radical Muslims. Then people were scratching their head and go like, are we not fighting the terrorists? Now, are we arming the terrorists? What mm -hmm. is going on? And once you enter the details of international politics, you find out that under President Obama, terrorists were armed in Syria and he called them freedom fighters. Yes. And under the, under the um, presidency of Ronald Reagan, 
Al-Qaeda, that was in the 1980s, Al-Qaeda was armed in Afghanistan and he called them freedom fighters. Now, okay, if you see that, then you go like, so does the CIA work together with the radical Muslims? And the answer is yes. yes. <laughs> and then you go like, why would they do that? Are they are they are they some some secret Muslim group? No, they use they use the Muslims in Afghanistan against the Soviets. You know, there was the Soviet invasion, and everything. Um, and in Syria, they 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 used the Islamic State and everything, the groups that they supported. Um, to overthrow Assad, it didn't. It didn't work out. Okay, they, they didn't succeed. But if we now hear Netanyahu made sure that Hamas continues to coexist, to, co to exist, you know, he didn't cut off the funding for Hamas, which came out of Qatar. Um, then you go deep into this analysis, and you go like, certain guys are just totally crazy. Yes, and and that's you know that's. That's why I'm grateful for your work because you bring context, you bring, you bring stories to people that they don't hear on CNN. Actually, the CIA regime change war in Syria, Timber Sycamore, costed one billion dollar per year for the CIA, yeah, and in parallel, yeah, the New York Times said it's one of the costliest covered operation in the history of the agency. Uh, and in parallel, there was another program by the Pentagon, and they were coordinating from Jordan and from Turkey to arm and train these jihadists in Syria, if it's correct to call them jihadists, anyways. And uh, these weapons uh, ended up in the hands of al-Nusra, in the hands of I ISIS. And those are things that are all documentable in Syria. And I think giving this context is very important uh, for the people to understand Syria. And unfortunately, very few people want to touch on this. However, we have lots of confessions now. The former prime minister and foreign minister of Qatar comes and says, in behind closed doors, Bandar bin Sultan asked for $2 trillion to destroy Syria, and they couldn't collect of course two trillion dollars but the estimates are around 200 billion dollars and if we compare 200 billion dollars with ukraine the size of syria is so much smaller than ukraine they spend about 150 billion in ukraine in syria they spent 200 billion dollars and they couldn't um i would say succeed uh, militarily but they are now partially succeeding economically by choking the Syrian people through the sanctions, through the stealing the oil and blocking trade uh, and o o everything. The UN is, uh, officials are disgusted by what the United States is doing in Syria. And I think uh, people uh, like yourself are bringing light in the darkness. And I was really, really excited uh, to have you on my channel. And I was really, when I sent the email, I had uh, one percent hope probably you would uh, reply uh, to my email i know you're a very uh, busy uh, person and when i received the answer i was showing it to my wife with great excitement i'm very very thankful for the work you do because it is important in the darkness for someone to light uh, a candle yes. and the more people when you enlighten more people and those uh, you're enlightening the minds of the people and they're waking up to the darkness that we are living in. I've seen things in front of my eyes that nobody has to see in Syria, right? And we don't wish for uh, the Ukrainians to live similar experiences. We won't, don't want for anyone around the world. Therefore, education is very, very important to bring peace. Since we were speaking about peace, speaking about ceasefire, uh, making people understand why they are worse. We have to introduce them to Julian Assange. We have to give them the documents and read. He's a hero. That, He's a hero. Yeah, He's a hero, of course. Uh, Julian Assange is in London right now as we speak, and he's in London and he's in prison, and he should be freed. He should, be, yes. you know, he should be set free. Actually, George Bush and Tony Blair should be in prison because they attack <laughs> Iraq. I mean, yes. it's crazy. The world is upside down. Yes. Dr. Daniela Ganzer, I'm really grateful for the time you dedicated uh, for me and for the audience of Syriana Analysis. I'm sure they appreciate your insight. Guys, uh, of course, his social media platforms in the description below, but most importantly, the links for his books are in the description below. The English versions, I will also put it in the description below. I will just divide them between German and English. And if you like to purchase the books, you can know where uh, to go and purchase them. Dr. Daniela Ganzer, thank you very much again for being my guest today on Syriana Analysis. Kevork, thank you very much for having me and thanks for your profound research. Thank you.